Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the concluding part of the first Tank Destroyer week because feedback has been really good, lots of comments, lots of questions, we haven't got any closer to answering the riddle about what the hell a Tank Destroyer is and I promise you tonight's show is not going to get any closer again to, to sorting out that problem but it's been a great discussion all the way. If you're new to the channel, a few new people have come in via the Chieftain. Welcome to World War II TV. All the links you need are in the description below. The links to my Patreon account and how you can become a YouTube channel member, etc., etc. But today's guest, Philip Knight, or PM Knight, is the author of a series of books about British armor in World War II. The one we're talking about today is this latest one, Crusader Gun Tractor, A Technical History. But we're going to talk not just about its technical history, we're going to talk about its operational use as well. And it's going to add, as I say, another dimension to the what is a tank destroyer, because we're talking about a vehicle that had been a tank that is now being used as a vehicle to tow a towed a piece of artillery. So is it a tank destroyer? It's there to destroy tanks. So it is a tank destroyer, but it's also not a tank destroyer because it's not a tank destroyer. But we'll get into that later on. But I'm going to bring Phil in now. Good evening, Phil. How are you today? I'm all right, Paul. How are you? I'm, I'm good. So as you heard me there, the whole what is a tank destroyer, if something dro knocks out tanks or destroys tanks, it's a tank yeah. destroyer. But of that's course, like, there is yeah, a doctrine. Like, like a typhoon, that's a tank destroyer, isn't it? That's a tank destroyer. So is a Piat. So, so, so is HMS War Spy or something like that. So is, <laughs> so, 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 is, so, is a, so is a hedge that stops a tank in its tracks. That's, yeah. that's a tank destroyer. Anyway, so this is a really, really unusual vehicle, isn't it? Because it's just, as I said then, it's a combination of recycling something that had been used for yeah. use to do something else. So give us yeah. what, what, a background as to why you felt this was something that was worth writing about outside yeah. of just pure tanks. Well, it was just, it was just a natural progression. Um, I, I wrote the book on um, the Crusader tank, and it was a sort of a... Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd done a little bit of research as part of that. And I, I was, I mean, basically the way I write books is, is, uh, um, I don't have much control over the, uh, the vehicles seem to choose me rather than I choose the vehicles because I, I tend to get accumulate as I go through the archives, more and more material on, 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 on various vehicles. I get more photos and what tends to happen is, um, if I, I start to find out unusual and, and unexpected things about them. And so a, a sort of a narrative starts to emerge when you find out something about, when you find out about tanks or, or vehicles and you find out things that are unknown and uh, that are surprising, you, I mean, I tend to get a, a um, you know, an urge to kind of, you know, uh, tell people, you know, it, yeah. it, it's like, it's like a package of surprises. And, and, and a lot of my books are really, I mean, um, when you read them, they, they will tell you things about that particular vehicle that you wouldn't have expected and um, should surprise you. I mean, the first book I really did was a Covenanter. And what surprised me about the Covenanter, contrary to the endless barrage of opinion on it, is actually the Covenanter was a pretty reliable vehicle, amazingly. Um, and um, why it's still seen as um, particularly unreliable it is, is quite, uh, it amazes me. But if you go to the Home Forces War Diaries, there's almost no complaint about it. Um, well, this is going to come up a lot, isn't it? Is that It came up last night with the Chieftain, is that we are still in 2023 burdened with some of the things that was written about some of these things back in the yeah. day or in the post-war era about this being crap, this being good, Sten guns go off when you drop them, this, you know, yeah. every tank's a tiger, the seven, yeah. And and it's it's important to go back and see what was being said at the time because the amount of veterans I've met over the years who would would pass over some you know, perceived wisdom of the day yeah. they'd never yeah. used this bit of thing themselves or actually seen one but they a reputation had been earned of something yes. being really good or really bad or whatever and they pass it on but anyway you've come armed with a powerpoint you're in charge of so what we're going to do folks tonight is phil is going to kind of do, go take us through kind of a half an hour introduction to the vehicle and i will throw in a few comments and, as we go along and then you guys can come in with your questions at the end of that kind of 30 minutes and we can go into whatever we want to talk about because phil knows british armor inside out so we can go into archers we can go into uh six pounders 17 pounders tanks whatever we want to go into really but the point is we are talking particularly about anything that is involved in the destruction of enemy tanks but basically over to you phil and uh, take us through this really interesting vehicle yeah, well, um, I'm going to start with the the Crusader tank itself, which the the gun tractor was based on. It's a it's a uh, the tank that hasn't got hasn't got a particularly great reputation. Um, 
it struggled throughout the Middle East, but its struggles were, were largely um, in tandem with the struggles of the British Army uh, and the Germans. And um, by 1943, Middle East forces sort of they gave note because they, 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 the Sherman tank had arrived at the beginning of the battle. Uh, 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 prior to the Battle of El Alamein, the Shermans had arrived. And I think as, as, as the Second Alamein started, um, uh, in the last, you know, last quarter of 1942, and the Sherman was looking like a big improvement on the Crusader. Um, so, although, although there were plenty of Crusaders still in the theatre that could be used, um, Middle East forces, at least GHQ, the headquarters of Middle East forces, were, were heartily sick of it because it, it tended to sort of gum up workshops and, um, uh, you know, it, it was always it was, it was a very difficult tank to manage because it was a very um, technically sophisticated tank, um, and there's a lot that could go wrong with it. I don't think everything that went wrong with it was all to do with the tank itself, personally. Um, so they basically told the war office, you know, we don't once this campaign's over, we don't want any more of these, and we and it's basically obsolescent. Um, this is ironic because actually, in, in the pursuit of the Axis forces after Second Alamein. Um, the crusade actually came into its own as a, as a tank because for the first time it was actually being used properly uh, mm. and and although the ghq tended to send messages back to the war office saying all oh, the shermans are outstanding actually the pursuit of the axis after second alamein it's the crusaders that are always in the lead because they can actually keep track of the um fleeing germans and italians because the, the crusade because it's quite a it's quite a low lying tank it's quite surreptitious um, and it can move in. It's quite fast. It can actually, you know, um, they can actually get into positions and observe that Shermans, they just stand out on a flat desert landscape. They just stand out and, and, and grants. They just stand out a mile away. So that the, the Crusader's got a, it's got a value there. And the other thing is, is um, it's, it's, it was quite good at um, seizing features that, 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 that were advantageous, but um, uh, needed to be seized quickly like ridges if, if, if there's if the germans had, had, had missed a ridge the first thing you do is send us some crusaders up seize the ridge and then you know um, and then you move the grants and the um uh, shermans and maybe some 25 pounders up just to just to hold that ridge so so the so, so the crusaders are moving first and the and the grants and the shermans are following right so um i say it has a it has a kind of checkered reputation um it's got, it's got, it has got reliability and durability issues, but um, it's not really much worse than what the Panzer III or the Panzer IV are. Uh, the, 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 there's, there's the, the, a general notion that in in the early stage of the war that British tanks are sort of outclassed by German tanks, um, and I don't think that's true. I, I think actually that the, the, they're very closely matched. The, the 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 tanks the British have up till prior to the Battle of Gazala in in mid forty two. And the German tanks are much more closely matched than people um, tend to think, uh, or the impression that's given. And I actually think, if anything, the British had a slight advantage. They had they had tanks that could do things that the Germans. Well, couldn't. well, you hinted at that earlier. It's doctrine and tactics that are maybe yeah. at fault. It's like 1940. We're going down a massive rabbit hole. I'm saying rabbit hole early as it's Friday, so everyone can have a drink. Is you know French armor in 1940 compared to German yeah. armor? French armor yeah. was almost across the board better than German armor. The Germans were basically using it better uh, and had yeah, better yeah. communications. Yeah, the German. I mean, the the, the 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 position is in the first half of the war is that the German army is just much better than the British army. I mean, that's the harsh truth. Um, and um, but but I mean, in fairness to the British army, the Germans are sure better than everybody because they're better than the Red Army, they're better than the French yeah. army. You know, they're 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 better than everybody. And 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 but what happens? And I think that the Middle East forces they they kind of because because they've sort of um, made so many sort of um uh terrible errors they've made so many mistakes trashing you know trashing their own tanks is kind of the only card they've got left to play to sort of preserve what's left of their reputation and so um i, I you know there, there's a i mean i, I mean i could tell <laughs> i could tell you quite a few things about middle east forces that a lot of people don't know and haven't been found out yet but they were they were there's there's a lot of bad stuff that went on that hasn't really been uncovered um and so and rather than admit that they they tend to I mean they tend to create this mythology of what they want to do really is they want to make the, the it look as though their their failures have been technical 
rather than technical and tactical and operational and leadership failures. So they create a bit of, myth, of a mythology around the Sherman as this kind of transformational piece of technology. Um, but that doesn't really hold up because all the Sherman really is, is a, is a sort of ergonomically more efficient grant, you know. Mm. And, and in the Battle of Gazala, they, they based their tank force around the grant and got royally thrashed. You know, so this 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 sort of narrative as, as a show as this sort of um, transformative technology, I it doesn't for me really hold that much as much um, water as, it sh as, as as people think. And what they did do, what the Royal Armour Corps did do, or the, or the armour divisions in the Middle East after Gazala, I think they got some inform I think they got some information from from military intelligence because there were a lot of German doc um, document seizures after Gazala. Um, I think the Australians found found some um, uh, German intelligence cell or something, and they and they got a lot of documents. And I, and I think it's only after Gazala that the, the British start to get the intelligence of, of what the Germans have been doing to them. You know, because the Germans have been playing some really really nasty tricks on the British. Um, and what the Germans have and what the Germans have made the mistake of doing because these tricks are so successful, they can they've um, turned them into battle drills. So once you turn something into the battle drill, you put it on a piece of paper that could be captured, right? And what the what the um, Middle East force, what what the the, the armored divisions and armored brigades um, did after Gazala and, and the battles after that is they totally changed their tactics. But that's played down. The the, the, the playing down of the the changing their tactics are played down, and the and the sort of the, the new technology of the Sherman is played up. So you get this idea. So you get this narrative. Oh, we've had all these crap tanks, and then the Sherman has come along, and oh, it's a, you know American tanks are fantastic, and and it's changed and it's changed the war for us. But really, what's been happening is the Germans have been really outplaying the British for a long time. The British have been very slow to learn and, and slow to figure out what's been happening to them, and 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 they've the British eventually eventually sort of cottoned on, put their foot on the ball, changed their tactics. And 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 they and they and they decided to have some success, you know. So, uh, but either I, way, the point you're making is is the end of the Middle East campaign is the t is the ch end of a chapter, isn't it? And it's time yeah. for a new chapter now. Whether or not things were abandoned that could have been carried on with, and whether or not the Crusader was as bad as is hyped up to be, clearly, by in your opinion, not. The point is, it is a new chapter. There is a there there is going to be new stuff ahead, and which brings yeah. us to the to this to what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So another thing is, it's just the Crusader. Another thing about the whole thing, the, the durability and reliability thing of the Middle East. Um, it's so it, home forces Crusader hasn't been a problem at all, really. So um, it's, it's it's suggesting that the, a lot of the reliability and durability issues in the Middle East have been um, sort of it's, the, the unreliability has been circumstantial rather than inherent. That's what I, that's right. the point right there. I'll go to the next slide, and that's the a Crusader itself. Um, one thing about all all British tank designs in the Second World War pretty much are very low silhouette tank designs. Um, it's something they don't really, British don't get credit for really, but it's it's they they are consistent. Um, it's got uh, the, the, the notable features are are the two pounder gun at the front and at the back. Um, you can see the round thing is the auxiliary fuel tank, and just before that, you it looks like two pack men two pack men um, yep. you know headbutting the wall. Um, and that's the um, air cleaner. And, and this is the the, the real um, technical problem with the Crusader is, well, it's Liberty engine because the mostly uh, durability and reliability issues on the Crusader are to do with the Liberty engine, and the Liberty engine gets a bad name, which is not really deserved because the the problem with the Liberty engine, at least the ones that the Nuffield Mecha, the British make, not all of them, but the ones that British make, is that the carburetors are at the back of the engine, and why that's a problem is really when you de design an engine for a tank, you want the air cleaners, right, which which clean the charge air that goes into the combustion chambers. You want them in the fighting compartment beneath the turret because that's where you're going to get some clean air. If you don't have the, uh, but if you have the carburetor at, at the rear of the engine, you can't really feed them forward through that tight engine compartment. You can't pipe them. You can't pipe through to the fighting compartment. So they have to put the air cleaners at the back of the tank. And that's where the, the dust is kicked up. So those those air cleaners are going to pick up dust and sand. They're going to get into the engine combustion system. From there, they're going to interfere with the combustion, but also they're going to get into the lubricating oil of the engine, act as an abrasive, and wear out that engine 
quick more quickly than it should be and this is one of the problems with the crusader and it is really down to the the air cleaners but and, which is which is sort of necessita it's the, it's the position of the air cleaners which is necessitated by the uh, the architecture of the engine with the carburetors at the rear uh, um so that's the, the, one of the issues now by the end of 1942 they built 3000 crusaders um they need to find they've got to, they know they've got about 1800 it's a bit less than 1800 they've got to build by september 1943 they're on the cards they can't change that build program and they think about it they try and investigate it but they can't really do it so they've got a number of options to, to try and um, find some use for them. Now, the first thing they try is this what's called an Arcticized Crusader. So the, the idea is that they, they, they'll make some modifications to make it more um, uh, sort of uh, more more viable in, in cold climates. And, they, and, they, and they've actually got some experience of this because they, they've had to Arcticize um, Matildas and Valentines for the Soviets. So it's the same kind of, well, I don't know exactly what it is, but you, know, you, you need some sort of primary thing to primary source to pri some sort of primary method of warming the engine and things like that, you know, and, and, prepare, right. and prepare and prepare tools and and have you know put put grips on the tracks to make them move in snow, all this kind of thing. Um, and the Soviets almost look like they're going to buy this, but they don't. They the Soviets sort of. Um, uh, they sort of back off in the end, and it's probably a good. They've seen I mean, the Soviets have seen the Sherman. <laughs> well, well, no, well, it is, but I mean, things that the thing is, like the, the Soviets like simple tanks. I mean, the, the Valentine is is ideal for the Soviets because it's so simple. They don't, they're not so keen on the Matilda because the Matilda is 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 more complex tank. I mean, it may have worked because again, the good thing about move, using a tank in winter is that there's not much dust in the air, right? So you might actually get a decent mileage out of the Crusader in those circumstances, but. It's, and, it, and the Soviets know that it, it's, an, it's a tank that's kind of been been around and, and it's, it's, on its, it's on its last legs. Then there's this idea of this Crusader observation post tank um, for the Royal Artillery. And this is just a Crusader with a gun removed and some extra radio sets for frontline um, artillery regiments. And it's just there for sort of spotting targets and, and radioing, radioing back to the, the guns and things like that. Um, and they, they, and, and they do put a contract in for about 700 of these um, Crusade observation post tanks. But this is stymied by the Americans because what's happened is the, Amer the British have um, overordered Shermans from the Americans. And, um, and uh, because the, the, the British in, earlier in the war, they wanted to really expand their, they thought they could expand their armored force to this kind of, you know, this really big armored force. And, then, and and they blatantly realise they're just not going to be able to get the manpower for this um, armoured force, and they're, and they're not going to have the opera. And once the Middle East sort of dies down, they're not going to have the the real the the, the, the operational. They're not going to have they have sort of what's the word the, the operational. Um, fit, there's not going to be enough, enough operations to absorb these tanks. So um, so they sort of say to the Americans, well, we don't want these Shermans now, and the, the Americans quite quite reasonably say, well, tough luck, you you've ordered them, you're going to get them. So, um, so the British go, okay, well, we'll take them, and then the, so they've got, oh, well, well, as a as a Sherman's a bit more of a modern viable tank than the Crusader, we'll make the Sherman's the OPs, and the Crusader loses that opportunity. And then the other thing is that there's about 650 Crusader anti-aircraft tanks on on order, and they're going to go ahead. Um, that, that, there's, I'm, I'm doing a book on those at the moment, and that's a, that's a story, but. Um, they, 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 the, 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 they kind of, they, they will go ahead and be built mostly, and the, the at least the Ehrlichon version of that, the twenty millimeter Ehrlichon version, that will work. It's, it's a viable tank. So, um, and the last one is this gun tower stroke infantry carrier they came up with. So this is proposed um, in June nineteen forty three by um, the DSIGs, the Deputy Chief of the Imperial General Staff, which is Ronald Weeks, who's actually an engineer himself. He's, I think he's ex Pilkington in Glass. Um, he's the man at the War Office who looks after all the procurement. Uh, it's basically, there's a funny thing going on in the War Office where you've got this hierarchy, you know, you've got the, I think it's a minister, because Winston Churchill is the Minister of War, I think, as well as Prime Minister. Beneath him, you've got Sir James Grigg, um, a, a, a man whose who's career is very unexamined. He's a very interesting character, is James Grigg. Beneath Grigg, you've got um, obviously um, what's his oh, what's his I forgot his body name. Uh, the, the, the chief of the Imperial uh, Allenbrook. Allen 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 and beneath Allenbrook, you've got Ronald Weeks. 
And the thing, funny thing is, is that Churchill and Churchill and um, it's, I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole now. But Churchill and, and Alan Brook uh, are, are sort of like a pair, and they and they always they're always liaising and working together. And James Grigg and Ronald Weeks are a pair, and they liaise and work together. But but Alan Brook rarely talks to Griggs or Week, uh, uh, Grigg or Weeks, you know. So they, there's this sort of strangest Georgia thing because Alan Brook doesn't get involved in tanks at all tank procurement at all really so it's kind of like there's almost this separation where alan brooks very separate is on the operation side and grig so james grig and, and ronald weeks look after the procurement side and and and, and churchill and alan brook rarely involve themselves in that um but the ministry and so they, they have this meeting they have a sort of weekly meeting with the ministry of supply who are the, who are the tank who, who, who coordinate tank production and, and help can coordinate tank design and development. And, um, and they buy in, but they always do. You know, whatever, what, what nonsense the War Office buy, the Ministry of Supply, they'll, they'll try and make it. And um, foolishly, because uh, they, they set themselves up for far too much grief by, by, by going, on with a, going along with these War Office um, uh, kind of... Uh, Directives. Directives, well, there, you know, a lot of them are wild goose chases. A lot of them turn out to be wild goose chases. Also, who the person who buys in, it's the director of Royal Artillery, director of the Royal Artillery, which is uh, William Eldridge, and the director of infantry. They're quite keen initially, the infantry, and that's uh, Thomas General Major General Thomas Wilson. And what they do is they get uh, Nuffield, the company called, they get to design it is Nuffield Mechanisations, who are, who are responsible for the, the original Crusader. Now, Nuffield Mechanisations, they're based, they're, they're part of the Morris Group, they're part of the, the Morris Motors, you know, Morris Commercial Cars. Um, they're in Birmingham and they're very much the Ministry of Supplies E team, really. You know, they're, 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 they're the least competent private firm for making tanks, um, but they are probably the most pliable. So they will take on any project. Um, they won't necessarily be successful in it they, they've probably got about a 50 50 record of success but they are pliable and the, the companies they rope in are Foden's it's truck builders in Manchester to build the first prototype Rust and Buckerus in Lincoln and they're excavator manufacturers and um, to build prototypes and and the production company will be Russell and Hornsby which is basically the same company as Rust and Buckerus Russell and Hornsby make um, agricultural machinery and these are these are all been making Crusaders. These are all part of the Crusader production group. So, so all these companies know each other. So, and what happens is, um, amazingly, Nuffield Mechanisations do a really good job on the gun tractor. Um, they they come up with a quite a neat design. It's it's basically they take away the front of the the front of the hull and the turret, and they produce this um, superstructure, which is a fourteen millimeter armoured superstructure. Um, so uh, yeah, and, it, and it's got. We can see here. This is the front. This this is that's the driver's hatch, and this is the what's called the vehicle commander's hatch um, at the front. At the side, you can see there's there's a pat there's a, an open area which is where the side access door is, and that folded inwards. I think on this picture it's actually been removed because there seems to be some hinges standing proud. Um, and um, if you just look at the corner, the front corner, you can see you'll see this rod. Um, it's a rod on the corner and there's a rod at the rear and what those are is they're struts for holding the canopy roof and they just slide upwards for the roof canopy so and it's, it's got all these little nice little neat design features and, and nice little neat stowage um, compartments and so forth so if I go to the next slide this is a this is a, a stowage diagram and what you can see in the middle is this it just shows what the crew compartment behind the driver or, or what's called they're not called a crew they're called a detachment it's, it's the compartment for the detachment and in the middle there's a central stillage and that that holds 17 boxes each of two rounds of 17 pounder ammunition right so it's all that's all stored right in the middle of the vehicle and either side of that um, central stillage here are three seats either side for for six six members of the gun crew um and at the rear and, and at the rear you can just about see them just behind the stillage you can see there's there's six lee enfield rifles a bren gun um and in the driver's compartment there's a two-inch mortar so they're, they're actually pretty well pretty well armed mm. 
well as having you know they they they, they can fight as a as an infantry section really. Um, the rear there's these two big boxes which you can see with tarpaulins on on the top of them. They're called the ready ammunition bins, right? And there's three rounds in each bin. Um, and there's also lots of other tools and, and and so forth within the bins. I think some blankets. So you've got 40 rounds of ammunition there, six ready, 34 stored in a central stillage. On the back of the engine deck, that's a spare tire for the 17 pounder gun. And there's there's two sizes of tire for the 17 pounder. There's there's a, there's a large size and a small size. And the advantage of the large size is it's better for road running because obviously it, if you've got a larger a larger wheel, a larger tire, um, the, the, the rear will rotate more slowly. So there's less wear induced. It's easier and it, and it copes with bumps better. A larger tire, it wears less, the wheel wears less slowly and the, and the wheel will cope with bumps better. The advantage of the small tire is it's easier for the gun detachment to manipulate the gun with smaller tires because there's less um, inertia in those small tires. Yeah. So yeah. generally, you'll all, you, and generally they always they they tend to go for the small tire. So most seventeen pounders have small tires because just because uh, this is something I'll go into later. It's just such a heavy beast of a gun. You've got to make it. You've got to do what you can to help um, the the crews manipulate it. Well, this is going to jump in with my first question about this because we're coming. You've come at this from the angle of hey, we've got these Crusader chassis. They're in production. We don't you know just abandon them. We need to do something with them. But at the same time running parallel to that is the fact the 17 pounder has been coming in as the new uh, standard british anti-tank gun replacing the six pounds and other things like that yeah. what had been the feedback from the use of what have, what have they been using to get the 17 pounder interaction before this and what were its shortcomings and what how was the crusader uh um assisting with those shortcomings well i mean the the, the um the 17 pounder first comes in in i mean they're actually, they're actually firing it um early sort of january 1943 in the middle east there, there's yeah. some come in after the battle of Al Al alamein then they bring them in in tunisia on these sort of modified 25 pounder carriages um, i don't think they actually fire at anything but i think they they oh, i don't think they actually use actually in action i think they, they, they get in place in place occasionally to use but i'm not sure because i'm not really researched this but that's what the impression I get. There's quite a lot of um, technical issues with, they're called pheasants. They, they put these 17 pounders on these 25 pounder carriers. Uh, but I've actually got the uh, Royal Art, the, the RA diary for Tunisia. Um, and there's, there's, there's quite a lot of technical issues with these, with these 17 pounders and pheasants, which, which, which uh, doesn't help. In Italy, um, I've, I've, I've got some of the RA documents from Italy. Um, they like them. I mean, th th although they're, th th Weirdly, although Italy's sort of um, quite, uh, uh, it's a much more difficult terrain, um, the 17 pounders seem to get a good reputation in Italy. And I think it's because they they haven't got the option of, of self-propelled guns with 17 pounders. So, so um, they're just, they're basically, in, in Italy, they're towed with, I, I assume, quads or Canadian yeah. military pattern trucks, they're wheeled vehicles, but they also have some um, experiments in Italy with towing 17 pounders with Shermans and they seem to go quite well but I don't think they're going over really rough terrain but in Italy the 17 pounder um, there, there seems to be less complaints about the 17 pounder in Italy and I think it's the, the story the old story is they're not going to they're not going to get Sherman fireflies very early well, well that's like that's like out in the far east australian troops equipped with matildas and and, and yeah. stewards and stuff even as late as 44 and 45 saying they're great but they had nothing else and, yeah. you know it's yeah. if, if you if you have no tanks at all any tank is an upgrade isn't it but if you've seen something better so i think that that's that's that makes a good point that yeah if yeah. if you've got nothing Whatever you, whatever you've got that does a job is is better than nothing. Yeah, well, that's partly. But actually, I, mean, I, I, I slightly counter that because I think that actually, oddly, the Matilda was did have some features that made it unusually useful in the in the theatre in the far True, theater. true, true. Yeah, the Matilda, Matilda is hard done by in, in history yeah. generally. Yeah, but, but I think, but I think, Jeff, I mean, I think, and, and also to give the Australians some credit, I think they've got they they seem to have a sort of a a get down to it attitude that British people sometimes seem to lack. So I think Australians, you know, I, I think Australians are a bit of a, a bit of a tougher bunch than the British really in a lot of ways. So I'm, you know, you've got to give the Australians some credit, but anyway, um, 
So, um, yeah, so another thing about the, the, the technical side is that cr the Crusader gun tractor, there's about 40 modifications that have come out of the, the middle, mostly from the Middle East um, to improve the, the Crusader gun tank. Um, but now they're going to go into the Crusader um, gun tractor and the, and so, and the anti-aircraft tanks. Um, mostly it's just minor things, you know, that, that they're just, you know, there's, there's a few leaks here and there. And so they're, they're improving the seals, improving the gaskets, improving the pipe runs. Um, the most notable change is what's called a bevel gear fan drive. In the Middle East, um, they, they, there's two engine compartment ventilation fans on in the Crusader engine compartment. And in the Middle East, they've had a chain drive, um, which they kind of got working eventually, but it was a, it was a, it was a very poor design. And it, and it was a bit of a nightmare, these chains, because they, they had to have like the, these, these greases in the engine compartment squirting grease onto the, um, onto the chain. Um, and but there's but there's another thing is um, it's a slight problem. One what the, the, the Crusader has a three plate clutch between the three plate clutch between the engine and the gearbox. Now in a tank, um, the, the the mechanically weakest components are the are the components that receive the most amount of torque, and they are basically the clutch and the final drives. Um, they're not the most they're not the components most prone to fail. The, the component most prone to fail is the is the engine but that's largely thermal loading it's thermal cycling right. that ruins engines but in in, in the in the in the power within the powertrain of a tank it's generally the clutch or the uh, final drives and well that's what happens when you when you get a surge of torque so if, if, a, if a tank is moving very quickly and hits an obstruction that that quickly slows it or it hits a gradient that quickly slows it that the, the torque um onto the clutch and the um final drives just massively increases and they can break so there's actually a, a better clutch, a two-plate clutch that's been developed by Leyland, but they put that on the Centaur because the Centaur was a heavier. So Centaur's got a Liberty engine, and um, they put it on that instead. The, the, the clutch is slightly weak on the Liberty engine tanks instead of Meteor engine tanks because the, because the, the Liberty is slightly longer than the Meteor, so they've got less space for a clutch, so the clutches are narrower. Um, and the, the most important improvement, however, is unique to the gun tractor, which is they've got new, better air cleaners, um, and they're in a much better position. And, that, and they actually in, increase the durability of the tank from 1,200 miles to 28,000 miles in testing. And that basically proves there's nothing really wrong with the Liberty engine. It's been the air cleaners all along. And if I go to the next slide, you can see you can see the air cleaners. Uh, if, you, if you look at the back, you can see, actually see the, 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 the this, this picture has got actually the, the roof um why well, was it the the, the, the kind of the, the, the tubular frame for the canvas roof yeah. which you know, i've never seen a canvas roof fitted on them and just before just behind that just behind that bulkhead you can see those two sort of like like, like r2d2 looking yeah, yeah, things yeah. and they're the air cleaners and they're the same cleaners air cleaners that were fitted to the cromwell and what, what's happened is um they're much bigger air cleaners and they're in a much better position. They're not, they're not exposed at the back of the tank. They're, they're, they're moved further in, but they're, they're, they're protected by the ready bins, uh, but, they're, but they're still outside the tank. It's still not ideal, but, but that check that gives you your, the tank itself another extra 1600 miles before the engine starts to wear. So it makes the Crusader gun tractor a much more reliable and durable vehicle. Um, and the development of the Crusader gun tractor is it's unusually smooth and trouble free, especially for a nutshell mechanizations vehicle. Um, and the main focus is on the towing apparatus, what's called the sprung towing attachment. Um, and the real thing is what needs to be decided, decided at the rear of the vehicle is how high this hook is. Because um, when, when the 17 pounder is being towed, 17 pounder is being towed by the Crusader, it's being towed by a machine that can move it more quickly over rougher ground. Than it's ever tended to experience before. So the 17 pounder is being sort of found out a little bit now because when it's being towed sedately down roads by, by trucks, it's not being really harshly used, but now it is. Um, and this is the, the towing apparatus. It's quite simple. It's basically, you've got either side of it, you've got a, a, a metal, um, a, it's a fabricated metal block with a slot that holds a leaf spring and, the, and the, the, these either side of the and the hook in the middle held by a set of clamps. Now, what the leaf spring, the 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 the, the blocks that hold hold the leaf spring either side are called spring support blocks. And what they're they're mounted on, they're mounted on on pads that have been welded to the rear plate of the tank. So you've got a, a welded pad with a spring on each side. You've got a welded plate, welded pad, with a spring support block, 
Um, and, and in between those two sets of assemblies, you've got a leaf spring, and on the leaf spring is a hook. It's quite sim It's a quite simple assembly. Um, and this is this is a, this is a post-war photo. That's not a Crusader gun tractor. That's what's called an FV um, 402, which was a, a, a Cambridge carrier, which was uh, uh, based on the on the Oxford carrier, which was a, which was a very good vehicle in the Korean War. Uh, the reason I've shown you these photos is because it gives you um, an example of, of 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 the pitfalls of towing a 17 pounder. And what you the reason why you need to set the hook height um, correctly is because if you set it to if you set the, the height too low, the the spade at the rear of the trail of the gun will hit the ground. If you hit it too high, it's the muzzle wow. back. Yep. Yeah, the muzzle at the back will is likely to hit the ground. And so here's some nice photos of what can happen when you're when it gets wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So and this yeah. is all leading us nicely to this idea that has been a theme all week about tank destroyer doctrine doctrine, says the host. Bringing it, bringing it back to the theme of this week is that it's about often speed, getting interaction yes. speedily is there. So a vehicle that uh, that can tow a 17 pounder across a, variety, a greater variety of terrain means you can put it in a position where you need it. And the, the more effort that is spent getting, as you say there, the hitch at the right height is all facilitating yeah. that ability to when this thing needs to go into action, to getting into action, uh, a in the in the condition that it to meet the enemy in one piece and quickly. That's that's the whole point. That is tank destroyer doctrine in a in a in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah, Speed. yeah, yeah. Well, you're not going to get a, a 17 pounder in position quickly, but as, as we shall see, but, as quick um, as you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you say, um, um, again, this is the, this is where the spade. This is the other problem. The spades have dug in on this example. Again, the spade. The spades just doing what it's supposed to do, which is to dig in the dirt and stop recoil. So it's you know, spade. But and um, again, this is a, a, a closer with the spades. So that, this is the, this is essentially the problem. So the way they s solve this is oh, I got, the way to solve this is to put a limber between the gun and the vehicle, which is a, a standard number twenty-seven artillery tractor as used with the, the twenty-five pounder. Normally, this limber carries twenty-five pounder um, separate ammunition. I, I don't think they put. I don't think they managed to put seventeen pounder shells in it. Um, now the, the towing and also as part of the towing spring, another solution is is uh, to prevent damage to the gun. That towing spring between those two support blocks is designed to pop out on particularly rough ground before the gun gets damaged. And um, one of the issues of that is that becomes controversial because these springs start to pop out um, when the crews think you know they, they don't need to. And they also need to modify the 17 pounder. There's on the two when the two spades are brought together for towing, there's a ball joint in there. They need to strengthen the welding on that. And they need to strengthen the cradle clamp on the gun that, that holds a 17 pounder still while it's being towed. Um, so that's the number 27 uh, artillery trailer. And that, that that just kind of you know that allows it to kind of undulate over bumps without having that this pivot point, you know, there's a pivot point or up and down, it tips the gun up and down. So that sort of Help solve that problem. Um, and the other thing about the, the artillery tractor trailer is that it's got mechanical overrun brakes, which means that because the, the, the 17 pounder doesn't have um, overrun brakes, so the 17 when the when the vehicle decelerates slowly, the moment, momentum of that 17 pounder it carries on, and it, it, it can be a problem. It can push the spring too far forwards and possibly break the spring, or it can slew to the side. Um, yeah, the sprung towing attachment can can deflect outboard or inboard. However, the towing train is now seven sixty foot long, right? Uh, with with a gun trailer and a gun, and it accentuates a problem that's always been prevalent on the Crusader, which is called reverse steering. Now, this is a bit of a difficult thing to explain, but on the Crusader, Crusader has two steering mechanisms. It has a thing called a radius turn, which is uh, accomplished by a set of um, epicyclic gears, so that the 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 the, um, the 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 drive on the, on the, in the crusader, has, the crusader has two levers which he pulls left and right, you know, he pulls backwards to steer on the side he wants. And when he pulls his lever back so far, the the, the epicyclic steering um, will engage, and you'll get what's called a radius turn, which is a constant shallow turn. If he wants to turn more quickly, he pulls it back further, and the epicyclic steering disengages, and what's called a skid brake 
Uh, there's on, on the just before the sprocket, there's a, there's a drum with the set of standard um, brake shoes, and that engages. So you go, so you go, you go epicyclic steering, radius turn, skid steering, sharp turn. But what tends to happen is, is once when when you when you move further back and the epicyclic steering disengages, essentially for that short period of time, you've got no steering. Okay, and what will tend to happen is the 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 the, the, the um, vehicle will flip back to its original course. Um, now this should only be momentary. But if you haven't got your skid brake set properly, that can be a disconcertingly long time. That can be a few seconds, right? And that problem is accentuated because when you've got you're towing a 17 pounder and, a, and an artillery trailer, because they're basically acting as a rudder. So your steering can feel very disconcerting and slippery um, if your Crusader isn't its brakes aren't set up properly, and the, and the gun will just accentuate that. Um, and, and the sprung towing uh, uh, attachment, they, 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 it should be a simple component, but they completely balls it up. Um, they use material, the wrong material for the spring support blocks, um, which means that they're, they're, that they should use high tensile carbon steel and they use mild steel instead. So they can, they tend, they can break. Um, they're handed and they're often fitted incorrectly in production. So the, the spring itself isn't held as securely as it should be. So it becomes easier to flip out, and they find it 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 it, it fouls the 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 wading gear. They haven't put the two together, so they have to put these little wading extension brackets between the support blocks and the welded pads that are connected to the, the back plate, and they're not made very well. And the and the the welding isn't very good, and they can collapse. And they're supposed to be removed after the waterproofing, but they rarely are. So you, you have this sort of saga all through. 1944 in northwest europe where these springs are popping out or the or their clap or the spring blocks are collapsing and it's all just a kind of a what should be very simple components um not being really um built properly and where this spring support block this is a spring support block and what they have to do this is one made of mild steel there's that piece of angle iron at the top and that and it's a reamy job to weld the angle iron on the top just to strengthen them but of course, it, it, the really don't capture every single one, and they probably add it to the ones that don't need it anyway. So it, it, it's it's just a bit of a mess. Um, and this is just this is a welding extension bracket that's broken, and this is what the leaf spring looks like when it's taken out of its support blocks. Um, so it gets issued to four corps anti four core anti tank regiments: the sixty second, ninety first, eighty sixth, seventy third. There's one per core. Uh, basically, they're there for sort of they're they're sort of there for, for protecting. They do a, ver a variety of roles, but they're for, they're there for sort of protecting transport nodes like bridges and crossroads. They're a reserve that can be used by the divisions and set that by by, uh, by um, you know formations such as divisions or brigades for particular operations. They can be you know assigned to them, and 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 more often than not, they they they're, um, they're used to form what's called the core stop line, and that's really the last line of defence. So if if there's a German counterattack. The core stop line is is the last line where they the Germans can be stopped. Um, the thing about these units is they're actually really well trained. They they spend several months training from January on on just on standard Crusader tank tanks because there's lots of them about. Um, and the, the, the first fifty are not produced till March forty four, and then they then they start to arrive in April. And it, and what's the strange thing about all these all these um, vehicles for, for for that are going to be used in Normandy and D Day? Is that um, they all arrive late? You know, all the Cromwells arrive at the last minute. The AVREs arrive at the last minute. The Duplex Drive Shermans arrive at the last minute. The Crabs arrive at the last minute. And, um, and but the, but the amazing thing is, and again, it's something that, 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 that they don't get credit for. Most of this stuff works as advertised. You know, it's, it's actually untested in battle. They're using it for the first time in this, in an extremely complex and dangerous operation. And it all kind of works as advertised. It's not perfect by any means, but it all tends to work properly, you know. Um, yeah, so and each, corps anti -tank, each core anti-tank regiment has four batteries of 12 guns each, 48 guns, two batteries of 17-pounder M M10, two batteries of 17-pounder Crusader towed, therefore 24 M10s, 24 70-pounders, 24 Crusaders. Each battery has four guns. As well as a Crusader gun tractor, um, 
each, each, each Crusader gun tractor, tractor is accompanied by a Morris quad, which carries 30 rounds and two extra crew members. Um, so it's a 10 man crew and gun detachment for a, for a 17 pounder compared to five in an M10. So another thing that's notable about a, 17, a towed 17 pounder is that it's heavy, uh, it's twice as many personnel. Right, so it, 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 it's uh, it's twice as expensive in terms of manpower. Um, da -dum -da -dum. So, the, and, and, in, and in Normandy, the M10 is fundamentally an offensive weapon, and the the the, the SP batteries of the core anti tank regiments and all the anti tank regiments are basically used as de facto tanks a lot, especially in the early weeks. Um, they're spectacularly successful against German armor. I think if people, are, I, I've got no idea how, you know, the, the um, if you, I mean, I, I look, if you go, if you look at the anti-tank regiment's war diaries, uh, it, it, they really are quite surprising how many German tanks they're destroying. You know, six, six or seven at a time is not unusual. You know, two or three Tigers, at a t claim Tigers or Panthers at a time is not unusual. They really do, work very well um the 17 pounder it's, it's the problem with the 17 pounder toad is it's fundamentally a defensive weapon and and that, that one of the um one one unnamed um uh commander of, of an anti-tank regiment referred to it as an effing coastal defense gun really um it's 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 twice as heavy as a 25 pounder it's extremely difficult to manhandle it takes 12 to 24 hours to dig in and it has to wait for the German. You, you, you can't go out tank hunting with a 17 pounder towed. You can't do it. You've got to wait for the Germans to meet you. And if you're the core anti tank regiment and you're right at the back at the last line of defense, you just don't see the. But you don't see them. I mean, there's one battery. I mean, the 73rd anti tank regiment arrive in Normandy, I think, on 7th of June. One of their batteries does not see a German, German tank in anger all, all the way through to VE Day, right? They don't see them. So basically, the experience of the um, the anti tank crews of tow seventeen pounders is pretty miserable because because you you go to your uh, you know your allotted position, you take 12, 12, 24 hours to dig in, and you just get mortared and sniped for three days, and then you move to your next position and you and you dig in for twelve hours and you get sniped and mortared again. Um, so the experience of crews is generally they're being mortared and sniped, and they don't have a, another thing is they don't have a way to fight back really, and that's very right. frustrating. So um, what tends to happen is um, that the Crusader gun tractor is actually quite popular, and you can actually use it for more than just towing seventeen pounders. They, they use it for a lot of lot of um, other work. Um, towed effect, towed seventeen pounder is effective on the rare occasion it's used against tanks, but it's just the wrong tool for an offensive army. And I think I think personally, the war was I've overrated the capacity of the Germans to effectively counterattack. They they put too many towed anti tank guns in. Well, and, uh, this uh, is why I was going to bring you up bring you up on this because the you know the Middle East, without going down a massive great rabbit hole, there it it was a sloppy campaign from both sides. It took you know, the British, the Commonwealth, the Allies a long time to get everything sorted out from the dark days of forty one through to to forty three, and Normandy. You know, we're stuck with this this idea. Well, some people say, oh, why were, they, were the Allies so slow in Normandy? It took them 76 days to get out of Normandy, blah, blah, blah. Well, as we know, that's bollocks. The Allies were under, ahead of schedule. They came out of Normandy quicker than they were expecting. And as you say, there was a maybe a bit too much caution around the German ability to counterattack. Yeah. We thought, the, or the Allies thought, the Germans were going to be the same kind of maybe mobile counterattacking force they were in 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 in, the, in North Africa and perhaps in in, in Sicily. Whatever. And in Normandy, because the Allies have the assets of the massive great navy, because the, the front line didn't move in land very uh, as quickly as it was intending to, which meant the navy... In, were part of the anti-tank role as well in a, in a loose sense they were tank destroyers as well aren't they yeah yeah so yeah. so and the air our air power of course is second to none at this point there the germans well, are, are struggling to mount mount anything so so it's like having something in it's it's like the mulberry harbor art, art argument is that some people say 
you know what? We didn't need, for example, the American Mulby Harbor because they were unloading stuff on the beaches, Omaha and Utah, really, really well all through the summer. So why did we bother spending the millions it cost on the Mulberry Harbor? The, my argument is it's your insurance policy, though, isn't it? That, it's, it is, your, yeah. it's your fallback. And it seems yeah. to me that these towed 17 pounders are part of a, provi a, a provision for a worser case scenario than ended up being. Yes. But yes that's yeah. we know that now with the benefit of hindsight. Things might not have gone so well for their lives. The, the, you know, the, the, and, and these might have been far more necessary. Because we know we know that when and I'll let you talk again, we know that when the Germans do some of these counterattacks, and Brad from OTD, Canadian military is going to jump in in a minute, and we're going to talk about you know Meyer and the 12th SX you know, pushing the little fishes back in the sea, all that bullshit on June 7th, June 8th. Villa Bocage, June the 13th, is an example of some German successes. And, and lots of historians for years have banged on about how brilliant the 12th SS were and how brilliant they were and how brilliant Panzerleer were and how hopeless the British were. But most of these counterattacks were repelled and stopped within almost minutes of them starting, certainly within hours and yeah. definitely within days. And at the end of these things, at the end of Villa Bocage, which some historians still claim is a massive, great German victory. It bloody isn't, because by the 24 hours later, the British have knocked out as many German vehicles as the Germans have knocked out of ours. And the same thing applies to the Maya counterattack near OT and Biron. Yes, the Germans knock out a few Shermans and Stuarts, but by, you know, roll forward 24 hours, the Canadians have knocked out more Panthers and, and, and Mark Fours and what have you. So, just because something doesn't need to be used as much as planned doesn't mean it's been a failure. It means that overall the the Allied planning was so good this 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 part didn't need to be relied upon. Is that a good summary? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I would I wouldn't disagree with it. I, th I think yeah, it, it is it is an insurance policy. Um, I'm gonna I'm sort of, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of uh, throw a throw a boomer uh, throw throw something in here. I think the biggest uh, tank destroyer in Normandy was the Royal Signals Corps. Oh. I think I think I think what the Germans couldn't cope with was and, and, and didn't understand and couldn't expect is how well the British Army and the US Army were networked. So and so you anything the Germans do, the British uh, have options. You can you can bring you can bring in an artillery barrage, you can move you you can move an armored unit, you can call in naval fire you can call in um typhoons whatever you know second half you can do all that but yeah. what you what 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 allows that to happen is signals and um i think adam too's made a point about a year or two ago about how, how signals is a black hole nobody's really looked at uh, just how um, allied signals work, but that's that's what that, the Germans can't cope with. Well, it, it it comes signals comes into that kind of category is you only notice if it isn't working. It's yeah. it's like yeah. it's like if for my game as a battlefield guide, you don't notice a good tour manager, so the person counting the people on the bus and organizing the meals, but you you really notice a bad tour manager. And I think yeah. the same applies to communications. If it's all working really well. You kind of take it for granted. If it starts failing, you yeah. notice it immediately. And I think, you know, in all our t t talk about, um, you know, fireflies and Joe Eakins knocking out Whitman if, if he did or didn't, it, it, this, this overriding idea of how well, how smoothly the Allies yeah. were operating in terms of connectivity. And yes, there's lots of examples of it not working perfectly, but basically it worked really well. And Phil Blood made the point, I'm going to bring in the, the, the renowned Dr. Philip Blood. The Germans went to Normandy thinking they were going to engage in mobile warfare. Within a week, they were defensive. There you are. That, that's, that's from someone who completely understands the German side of things. So the Germans themselves thought they'd be able to do more of a counter-attacking, mobile, hitting the Allies, pushing the Allies back to the beaches. Yeah, and week, they weren't doing it. You can't do that with people who, who, who have got lots of radios. You just can't do yeah. it. You can't, you can't surprise people. You can't, you know, if you, a lot of this sort of, this, this sort of German warfare is is based on surprising people on on you know no you know on, on giving you know doing the unexpected but you can't do you the unexpected if there's 500 eyes looking at you you know yeah. and of course the other thing that allies have is observation planes they've got you've got the osters up in the up in the sky trying to watching everything you've got guys on the every every bugger's got a radio so you just can't you can't work you know if you're if you're germans and, and you're looking at this sort of I mean, you know they're, they're very skillful 
but you can't be skillful against. I think, even, I, think yeah. I think the British even have radar sets on the. They've even ground radar yeah. sets yeah. Yeah. Looking, yeah. looking for movement, right? You, you can't do that. You can't. You can't work against that, really. No matter how. And, and, you're, and you're, the, the work you explained about getting the, the the towing correct. And yes, it was in the end, it was a bit complex. Complex, but they sorted that problem out. And you've now got this this tank. Uh, anti-tank force, as you say, is a core level. It's defending stuff beyond. Because I've, I've read, I read the chapters in your, your your book earlier. You know, it's doing. I was reading about the dates. And I was thinking, oh, that's so that's ten miles behind the line. So that's about eight miles where the front was. But it's, it's defending these really, really pivotal places. That yeah. had the Germans been able to mount something mobile, had the Germans thrust up towards the beaches, these things would have come into their own. And meanwhile. The Germans, the other side of the of the hedgerow or the wheat field, they're bringing everything up by horses. That you know that yeah. when you explain the loading and the ammunition in the middle there and the quit the the, the the rounds on the outside there and all and all that ability and the fact that the, the vehicles got the Enfields and, and two inch mortars, the Germans are using horses for all that kind of stuff. So it's the it's the strength in depth the Allies have that is that is that is winning the war. And yes, they're these these exciting, sexy things at the front are getting all the press. And I said this to Phil, when we were having our test chat earlier, folks, I think the worst thing uh, that ever happened with regards to Sherman Firefly was the Firefly being involved potentially in the death of Michael yeah. Wittman, in that it then overshadowed everything else the Allies had. And the 17 band of, in, in the Sherman Firefly with the 17 band was all right. Yeah. But actually, there were lots of other things, as you've made the point, that were equally good. The M10. As you oh, said, yeah, they're yeah, equally yeah. good at knocking out German yeah, yeah. armor. But the yeah, Firefly yeah. has become it's like the Spitfire. The fi Firefly is up with the Spitfire as it's being this one one piece of thing that's flawless, it's brilliant, it's the best thing since life's bread. And I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's been overhyped a little bit. I think the M10 was far better than the Firefly. I think it was a far better it's, it's a far easier. I mean, the, the thing with the M10 is it was it was stressed for a heavier gun anyway. The M10 was stressed for the, th the American three inch gun. Much more powerful gun than the, the seventy-five millimeter. Um, so it, it, you know, the, the, I mean, you know, you got you, you got to you, you know. And of course, the other thing, the other thing about that, that counts against the M10 is just there just seems to be far less photos taken of it. There's lots yeah. of photos of the of the of the Sherman Firefly looking great. You know, it always looks a real gnarly machine. There's there's much less photos, or at least photos that have been printed and distributed of the M10. 17 powder. Now, I, my, my view, really, I, I think the M10 is probably the most underrated armoured fighting vehicle of World War II. It's absolutely because it's not just really powerful, it's really reliable, it's really durable. You know, the, these, the, the, these guys in Normandy, they're, they're, they're sort of splatting tigers and panthers. And then in, uh, um, after the uh, Arden offensive, you know, the. Um, I think it's the third. I think it's the fifty third. What is it? Fifty third Welsh Division have to go to help the Americans in Bastogne. Yep, yeah, fifty third Welsh. Yep, yep. yep. And, 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 and it, these guys are using exactly the same uh, because seventy third. I think the seventy third anti tank regiment take their M tens down to to the Bastogne area, and these are the t same exactly the same vehicles that they've had in Normandy, and they've not had a single overhaul. They've not, you know, the, the, you know, they've they've had a, their sort of maintenance, but they've not had a, had any real um, serious overhaul you know and 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 it's they're still using them like six months later um so the m10 it can it can it's not just that it can splat you know tigers and panthers with i mean they, they seem to knock them out quite easily to be honest with you um but it's also that it's, it's got the legs to go right the way up to net to the to the netherlands and then be diverted all the way back down to belgium again go into the go into um trying to help uh, stop the Ardennes offensive, and then they go into Germany afterwards. So this, yeah. this, these machines are they're fantastic machines, um, and the people who use them absolutely love them. And another thing I would say is that actually, with the, 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 they're about they're about two. The, the, the core anti tank regiments are, are, are tested twice really by German attacks, and, and one of them is the I think it's the ninety first anti tank regiment gets um, gets into the norm, normally at the end of june and i think at the beginning of july they have a uh, they they do get hit by ninth the ninth ss division i think it's i think it's there's a is it the second i don't i don't, I don't know i mean i'm, I'm not a, a, a student of the german side but i think it's the is it the second ss corps have a counter yep, yep, yep. and, and 
and that'd be very uh, they, rich end of July. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and the and the ninth, uh, the ninety first um, anti tank regiment, which is the Argyll and Southern Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, uh, but they love the they love the Crusader gun tractor. Those guys love it. Um, but they knock out four Panzer fours with uh, I think they lose one gun and and they bat them off quite easily. So when when the the seventeen pounder is tested, it is it is it does prove to be effective, but it's the wrong. Uh, I mean, the one, the one, the one really um, big cock up they make with a seventeen pounder is is is, is this the, the operation stack against the the column bell steelworks, and that's and and what they do is the doctrine should be that when you have an infantry attack, um, the anti tank element is is M10 seventeen pounders, and that what is the infantry capture something, the 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 M10 seventeen pounders shoot them in, when the infantry sees it. The 17 pounders go the m10s go onto the ground and hold the ground with the infantry and then they bring the towed 17 pounders up and and only when the 70 towed 17 pounders are dug in do they bring the uh, m10s back now what they do in operation stack and i think there's also is it the hundred is it the 148 148 rac is that the regiment they they have it's a squadron of of an rac regiment of shermans uh, and, and it's the, um, I think it's the 51st Highland Division. They they attack, it's the 51st Highland Division attack the Colin Bell Steelworks, supported by I think it's 148 Regiment RAC. It could be I could have got that wrong. And instead of using M10s, they use towed 17 pounders in the assault, right? And they get and I think it's the 50 50 503rd um, Heavy Tiger. Heavy, heavy tank battalion, which have got tigers, intervene, destroy a squadron of. I think it's. Uh, it might be one four eight regiment RA. It is. I've just checked. It's one four eight regiment. Yeah. And, and they and they and they basically, um, it's it's an operational disaster. And my view is the reason that's a disaster is because they're trying to use towed seventeen pounders in the anti tank role. If there had been M tens there, especially seventeen pounder M tens, the five hundred third heavy tank battalion would have been hit by M10s and that would have been a bit more challenging for them than just the Shermans of um the uh, of 148 regiment RAC and, and and I think operation stack fails because they're trying to use 17 towed 17 pounds trying to bring them forward set them up dig them in in a few hours and 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 these and the, and the towed 17 pounder crews see these tiger tanks but their guns are pointing in the opposite, in, in the wrong direction to engage them. That's not going to happen in an M10 because you just rotate your turret or you move your tank, you know. So, um, so, 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 so there is an issue with the tow 17 pounder that it's not very flexible. Now, of course, by September 1944, um, there's barely any German tanks left to shoot at. So, what the 17 pounders? I mean, a lot of 17 pounders basically destroy more church towers than they destroy tigers or they destroy tanks you know they they're they're, they're used to, to take out snipers and observation posts so you know the 17 pounders but, but that was we and that came up again this week is that was it that was a thing a, a concept the allies are good at is repurposing things in the field in yeah. the anti-aircraft units towards the end of the war were less involved in shooting enemy aircraft and just involved in, in supporting river crossings and things like yeah. that. And the amount of 50 cows on American vehicles that just were firing horizontally for yeah. weeks on end uh, is because we had we have these resources. The Allies had these resources. You might as well do something with them. So do something with them. Yeah. Well, another thing, because, well, with the 30th Corps, they had sort of the idea called, they called it a pepper pot, um, where all these sort of redundant tubes, it's it's 4.2 inch mortars, 17 pounders, tank guns, um, light anti-aircraft guns, and they just they just they just become part of the, the general artillery barrage, indirect artillery barrage. And um, it, certainly the anti-tank regiments actually really enjoyed that because there's a lot of because these guys have been more have been being mortared for months on end. The idea that they could just just fire back really nearly at these German positions that they 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 is, is a lot of frustration being relieved during these pepper pots so yeah right well we'll do a few questions if you don't mind so we'll we'll as we're talking about 17 pound well jeff is asking what was the employment time or deployment time of a 17 pound on an engagement so behind a crusader how long does it take to get the gun off the crusader and into action i did not 
uh, they didn't measure that. I mean, the point is, it, it, you know, the you, it's you, not in. It's not in a. It's it's to do this core defense. It's not, so it's not speed yeah, isn't important. Yeah. Well, you got you you you, you, you the, the doctrine was that you don't um, fire a seventeen pounder unless it's in a gun pit, right? right. So, and then it takes you twelve hours. It takes you one or two days to dig a gun pit. So there's there's nothing. There's no spit. There's no measurement of speed involved. Right. Okay. Um, so no, it's just it's not, it's not, and, and even then, you know, they don't even get they they, bear, they rarely engage anything anyway. So okay. it's um, it's it's not really a speed issue. Well, this one's a massive rape rabbit hole. Where it could deserve its own show. Ian Carr is asking, how good was the Archer? Well, I mean, you know, there's a gentleman who's writing a book on this called Chris Canfield, who, uh, who will be on when he's finished his book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I think it's I think well, I'm I'm, I'm not going to you know speculate when it's going to be ready. He'll he'll know better than me. But um, he he he's the sort of the, the man for the Archer. The impression I get with the Archer is this: it's that. Um, when people, when crews who had um, crew uh, gunners who moved from towed seventeen pounders to archers loved the archer, right? Gunners who moved from the M ten to the archer were not so keen on the archer, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, it's 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 it was uh, it depended what you were doing before, right? And M ten crews, I think it's one hundred and second anti-tank regiment who'd been using M10s up till December 44, they were given archers and they didn't have a lot of, they, 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 they wanted their M10s back pretty quickly. Everybody else who were just, uh, uh, had been humping, especially, especially the infantry anti-tank regiments because the core anti-tank regiments got the, the Crusader, right? Which at least it's a decent tower. I mean, um, the infantry anti-tank regiments were using Morris quads. I think some of them even used Lloyd carriers to tow something pounds, which is ludicrous because you know um, and, the and guns. Powered. Uh, well, well, yeah, that, 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 they have difficulties towing a six-pounder. But um, yeah. so, uh, so yeah, those yeah. guys, those guys, the archer was like a revelation. It was it was fantastic for them. But it depends. Uh, it's that same people. thing. Of what depending on what you've been involved in before. It's this relative, is a good one. From Terry down here, um, did the gun tractor ever get used as an yes. APC like yes, a kangaroo? Yes, 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 it did, and it got used. It was the first kangaroo. Ooh. The the this is not well known. This is something I discovered: is that the uh, the Crusader gun tractor was used as an APC in Operation Blue Coat, um, and uh, carrying elements of the Forty Third Wessex Division. And it, and it carried them up to Mont Pinson on the assault okay. of Mont Pinson. And so, so um, the Canadians used, started using their kangaroos a few days later. There was the operation, the Canadian operation after Blue Coat. Uh, um, uh, totalize. Totalize, yeah. So, so they, so the, 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 the they were beaten to the punch, really. Oh, uh, see, I didn't know that. Open. I've, I've yeah. learned something there because I, I, I all, when I'm standing on the ground at Totalize, I say it's the first real use of, of, of APCs. Oh. I'm now going to go. It's the second real use of APCs because yeah. the Wessex lads used them at Montpensier. So that's, that's well, it was, it was worth having you on just for that one nugget. Although everything has been really good. Um, did the Crusader anti-aircraft ever engage Germans in the same way the Germans use light flak guns? Yes, I mean, I, I, there was um, what was the there there was the operation um, where the, um, the, the the it was it was it was towards the end of the um, what was it now where where was the Falaise. There's, Falaise, a, yep. there's, a, there's a Falaise operation where the Canadians and the Poles were kind of moving together. Yeah. And there was one where the there's I mean I I don't know that this in that in detail. I've not really researched this in detail yet. But there's certainly the Canadians use them during almost uh, the Canadians and the Poles use them against the SS um, almost at the same time. So there's there's a, there's a there's a period during the end towards the end of the Falaise operation, I believe, where the Poles were um, almost cut off and surrounded. And they're being yep. constantly assaulted, um, and the Poles use their Crusader AA guns as a last resort against the SS. Well, the, well, the Canadians in uh, the, the hill, the hill just uh, outside of Saint Lambert, Sir uh, yeah. when when David Curry is earning the VC in the middle of the village near the bridge, up on the hill, Hill One, I forgot the name, the designation of the hill, but there's Crusader anti-aircraft uh, vehicles there that are being used 
to sweep the corn, the wheat fields uh, for infiltrating uh, German yeah. snipers and machine gunners. So they definitely, but they're not being used, let's say, in the anti-aircraft role because there was pitifully little in the way of German air forces. But they were definitely being used there. That's that's where I can think yeah. of Crusaders. That's that's that one. I'm sure the poll. I think the polls had some on Montormel, which is about three miles yeah. away. So yeah, we, that that's a great yeah, question. There's late, there's later incidents. There's, I think there's a town in northern France where the Canadians. There's uh, the Canadian. Bill one one seven. Thanks, Sheldrake. That's it. Yeah. 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 And there's the the, the, the Canadians. Um, there's a is the South Albertas. The South Albertas use the Canadian A A tanks in the assault quite a few times. Uh, they, they use them in the Netherlands. There, there's an assault one. I think it's the Capish Veer. They use them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That came up. We did a show about the Capish Veer, and they did come up in that. I think about. Yeah. Thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. And, and and also because when the Crusader AA tanks were used, they were issued mainly uh, from July. At the end of July, they were given to the um, some of the anti-tank regiments as um, charges for the SP batteries. And the twentieth um, anti-tank regiment did use their Crusader AA tanks against infantry, and they also shot down a Focke-Wulf with their Crusader AA tanks. So. Um, so yeah, they they uh, there was, I mean I've, I've got there's, 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 I found two evidence of two German planes being shot down by the uh, by the the Mark ones, the Ehrlichon um, Crusaders. But wow, uh, okay, well we will bring the things to an end. Let's last one one final question. We did kind of cover this at the beginning, but I think I'd like to do it at the end now. And it's basically, as this is Tank Destroyer Week, what is Phil Knight's definition of a tank destroyer? I mean, you said that you know. Um, aircraft typhoons are so do, do you have a a potted definition of what is a tank destroyer is it doctrine is it vehicles is it is it what there we are over to you well yeah yeah you put me on a spot here because it's a it's a question i've never considered um so um i i, I think i think it's uh um yeah i don't know I don't know. I think, I, I, I think that's that. To be honest, that's my conclusion. Is it? Is it, I don't know. It. It is. It can be many different things. It all yeah, well, depends I mean, well, on purpose and, and well, use. I mean, in allied terminology, it's basically uh, it's basically a sort of a a a, 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 a tank. It's a vehicle that's um, relatively thinly. Uh, they tend to be what they tend to be. In, in, in seriousness, what they tend to be is it's kind of a. It's a very it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's almost like a variant of a tank, but they it's it's got an unusually powerful gun, and what they tend to do to um, allow that chassis to accept an unusually powerful gun is cut the armor down, and and why the M10 why the 17 pounder in my opinion 17 pounder M10 works better than the Sherman Firefly, is because the M10 has a, a thinly armored turret, a more thinly armored turret. Which means, which makes it that the whole vehicle more able to accept a heavier firepower gun than a Sherman tank, where it, where it's where it's you, you you've got this sort of excessively sized gun on, and I think right. that sort of compromises the function of the vehicle. So what you're doing with a tank destroyer is you, you're sort of sacrificing ar in the Allied side, is you're sacrificing armor for a heavier gun. So what you're focusing, and, and what that means is, in, in, strictly speaking, is you're limiting the utility of the vehicle because you because like the m10's got an open top so you can't you can't use it in in, in urban areas because people just lob grenades in it you know what i mean so you're compromising the utility of the, of the tank in order to uh, mount a more powerful gun so its role its potential um roles become uh more constricted that's what that's what you're essentially doing but but then again, yeah. they use the M, they use the M10 like a tank anyway. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah. and, and and Phil Phil Blood is admiring your honesty and just saying you don't know because I'm no I'm no closer to answering that question. It's that it's that basic triangle of three things you have to balance, isn't it? The same applies to an infantryman, and it is defense, firepower, and mobility. Those three things have never changed. If you if you go back, folks, we're going down a massive rabbit hole there. You go back to your Greek hoplites and your Roman legions. The Roman legions had lots of heavy armor, armor, short stabbing swords, couldn't march very far. Far your, your your Greek hoplites, less armor, spears could go a long way. Zulus could go a long way with a spear. British could go less. E everything is about sacrificing one of those three points to strengthen the other two. So if you sacrifice mobility for for, for armor, do you have a bigger gun? If you have a bigger gun, 
but you want to increase mobility, you have to sacrifice your armor. There is no perfect. You can't have all three things up. That is the, and that will never be, never be cured. That those three things you have to balance have always been the same. But we did want to just go in. Uh, um, wanted to confirm something about the units that served in Normandy. Were any of those conversions from anti-aircraft, or were they all factory conversion, factory produced as the gun tractor? Um. So there were some. I think my understanding is that about of those six, there were six hundred made. Right? right. I think only only hundred saw action. But of, of the ones that were made, um, five hundred about five hundred and fifty odd were new holes. They right. were stored, the whole stored for the purpose, and fifty were converted tanks. Okay. Well, that answers that one perfectly. So my final question is: When will you be back again? Because I've really enjoyed talking to you. I, I, we can we can do one of your other books, or we can just talk about whatever British armor generally, or we could have a panel discussion, bring you and John Buckley in, or something, and just discuss. I don't know, whatever. But it's been really great talking to you. So w will you come back? Is the, is yeah, the I'll come back. final yeah, question? I'll, yeah, I'll come back. Yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, I, not 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 too soon, but not I, tomorrow. I, yeah, I, no, no, but we'll, we'll plan something else. So, folks. That's it for today. We have got a Sunday show. Neil Story, my old mate, is coming on talking about the blackout murders. So we haven't done a, a crime show for a while. So we'll hear about some of those famous murders that the, uh, the, the were, the were part of World War II legend, basically destroying this idea that, that everybody in Britain was nice because the war was going on and that you could leave your door open, all that. We're going to explode that myth and talk about some of the notorious killers that came out of World War II. So that's on Sunday at 7 p.m. GMT. The links to Phil's books are in the description below. There are different places, Amazon, blah, blah, blah. You can find it at your local bookseller or order it, whatever. There is my copy there. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. I will see you on Sunday. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. Oh, there was that. That's that.